All right, folks, an interview after a long while. <laughs> I'm here with a good friend of mine, David Gregg. We go back, back in the, uh, those meetup days, uh, Christian meetup days, what, 2015, 2016? Yep, the, about that. Theological student back then, so a local Perth boy like me, and he's finally published his dissertation on memory work with respect to the resurrection, focusing on like the creed and First Corinthians fifteen and all the, the the finer details surrounding basically again this phenomenon of memory work and and applying it. Is there any application to the first century context? My questions will obviously be. Oh yes, that's that's the particular book you're holding up. But my questions will later on in the interview. I want to ask you about um, the Old Testament narrative that then gets funneled or telescoped into the creed itself. Because don't forget, the creed says according to the scripture, and then you have all this like resurrection, like in other words, the defeat of the gods and celestial flesh language, and in, in that same chapter. And but uh, before we get to that. David, introduce yourself and introduce why you've done this work and summarize your work. And yeah. Yep. Uh, sort of a brief selective background would be I grew up in Perth. I'm a pastor's kid, but um, I didn't have a lot of Christian friends growing up. And so there was a time in my life where I wasn't sure what I'd make of it all. But basically, my about my first year of uni, primarily through reading the Bible, as well as some uh, Christian apologetics books like Lee Strobel's Case for Christ. Uh, I came to think it was true. I was studying electrical engineering, but thought I'd love to go to Bible college even just to understand it a bit better. And I went to Dallas Theological Seminary. One of the things I focused on, like I did my master's thesis, which is not worth reading, but it was on Jesus' resurrection. So I had interest then. And I thought I'd love to be able to return back to Perth and teach. And I wasn't aware of many people doing things like apologetics. So that was one of the things that interests me. Although my PhD is not an apologetics PhD as such, it's a New Testament studies one on the quest for the historical Jesus, and it uses what's been called a memory approach to be in contrast to say a criteria of authenticity approach to say, you know, what can we say about Jesus' resurrection and it limits its scope to first Corinthians. But yeah, I guess it's just interest me is to say I've grown up with that background and it was yeah, a question of, yeah, is it true? It's worthwhile. And Jesus' resurrection in particular is something that Christians generally see as pretty central to Christianity. And so it was like, yeah, let's take time, look at this. And I've come to see that I think there's good reasons to affirm it. Yeah. Right. So let's, where, shall, I, shall I go straight for my questions and then maybe bridge it to the thesis work that, that you've written and yeah, happy to. Yep. 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 Okay. So, um, my interest has always been this big, larger narrative background of the past uh, that then gets funneled in this Jesus story. And doing a deep dive in, in say, Markin scholarship, and now, and then, port, like, you know, if you go down the ultra critical route, which is like, like, say, the four authentic Pauline letters of first, second Corinthians, Romans, and Galatians. Interestingly, just those four works have enough meat inside that takes the whole gamut of, you know, the Old Testament narrative and Paul's psychological change from a persecutor, persecutor of the church. And then this, this, this radical notion that, uh, oh, Yahweh did become a man and was crucified on a Roman cross. And so, what I find interesting, specifically in Corinthians, yes, Romans and Galatians, I suppose, are like, so Romans would be Paul's theological justifications for making sense of the theology of the cross, right? And then Galatians is more like a, you know, scholars argue if Galatians is one of Paul's earliest writings, and, and it's more so to do with his engagement with the, you know, the, the 12 in Jerusalem. And um, what I find curious is that in Galatians 3, he clarifies and says that Jesus became a curse for us, realizing the the radical shift of God's salvation history, right, in his plans. But but in Corinthians, it, he just starts off the letter with, the cross is nonsense, the cross is like nothing. 
and God used what is nothing to defeat what is something, and that is death. Um, that defeat language at, in, at the end of chapter 15 is death and the grave has been swallowed up, you know, in life. Um, in chapter 2, Paul has a very interesting remark about how the, the archons don't understand God's mysterio on the plan. But if they did understand it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Because again, just to summarize about the Old Testament context, I'm thinking of passages like Psalm 82, Deuteronomy 32, and this is from Old Testament scholarly work, like from say Mike Heiser and all that, where if you have this grand narrative, this build up from creation to all the multiple falls that transpire, then the disinheritance of the people group to the other gods, then ancient Near Eastern law codes and religions crop up, and then Israel has to be this this ever so small sort of like vehicle by mean by means that the Messiah will come through, which is Galatians again, Paul's argument in Galatians three and four. And then and then finally, when Jesus comes on the scene, um all Paul cares about is the cross in Corinthians. You know, the yep. cross is like God's power, God's wisdom. And that's the that's the irony. People are mocking that image because of how, like, seriously, you're the God of the cross? And it's like, yes, we are. So in the context of your work, if we, let, let's start with the negative. So say it's all false memories or it's some sort of made up stuff and all that. How interesting that you have what ha you have what's transpired in the Old Testament context. Then you have this people group, Christians, that are able to still come up with a very complicated amalgamation of Old Testament data with this grand narrative of like the, the, the table of nations and the reclaiming back of the nations and you know this whole narrative, right? To then uh the the ultimate directive purpose of this of this story is that it's the defeat of death, defeat of the grave, defeat of the powers, and then adoption, like Galatians four. Now, although we were slaves, now there's an adoption where we we now become the sons of God, right through this resurrection process. So, if it's all a false memory, I, yeah, I find it harder to believe that it would be a false memory based on. How they can the con they can conjure up this very complicated second temple discourse where there's a lot of confusion about who's to come first Elijah and you know they have all these particular people to come along and then they are able to just uh, mash it together synchronize it very efficiently and then make this discourse that we call Corinthians Romans and so on so the creed then and as you pointed out in your prior interview where scholars, uh, there's a variation of how old the creed is. So Jimmy Dunn obviously puts it months after the, the event. But the point is, there's this, the creed is so packed. You know, it's not, it, yes, it's just a simple few line creed, but there's just so much you can actually tease out um, based on what we already have, right? And based on what, say, the apostles already had. So did you engage that in your thesis or did you are you sort of going from say the new testament perspective back maybe or just you're just focusing specifically on the new testament like where like based on my response or you know what i'm thinking um how does that impact maybe your thesis like yeah yeah i got you lots of good thoughts there but um right. basically in terms of the reading I did read a decent amount, but I really feel like, um, as Ecclesiastes says, there's like no end to the amount of reading. And so the book itself, you know, is focused on First Corinthians and what memory has to say. But I like, actually, when I started my PhD, I actually was including the Gospels, but yeah, that got narrowed within the first year. But, you know, I did do some reading on that. Yeah, and like the backgrounds to the afterlife, that's really key is to say, yeah, what were people expecting in terms of that? So I did read on that, but I basically, because you have a word limit as well, which of mine was 100,000 words, although it's actually like 150,000 words if you count the bibliography. But um, anyway, so I read up on the afterlife, but I didn't take like my personal view. I basically just have a big footnote that says like, here's all the different stuff on it and you can look at the different views and that but you're right that sort of old testament trajectory of how they understand that's come into play and like in the creed 
I don't think too much this actually made it in my book, but there are people who think that the creed was longer and it may have had some stuff to do with Jesus' life in there. Uh, those who don't think that's the case, they still think that the creed would have had to be accompanied by something about Jesus because just saying that Christ died, it's like, who is this Christ? Like, what did you do and stuff like this? So there is sort of an expectation to do that. Some people thought that it had to do perhaps with catechesis, like teaching. And in that sense, it'd be like a launching pad to say that, you know, that Christ died, you know, as it happened um, under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and this, you know, that he appeared. And they may say, this is the appearance that, you know, you can hear more about so-and-so tells. So, yeah, there are people who have that sort of thing. But by and large, some of these more are still important details, but wasn't, say, as preferable, a little bit speculative, yet didn't come into, say, the final cut. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you have any questions? Or... Well, we're regarding each of those, like, ideas, are they all of equal speculative value or some are more evidence-based than others? Yeah, I guess yeah, it's just one of those depends, like, I think some of the scholars making it would be pretty prestigious and they do it a lot, but you may find they're one of the fewer people who talks about it. So, yeah, and so if you tend to go with just, well, this is what most people are talking about, this is the information in the text, it wouldn't be clear what the background or what could have been the case. So, yeah, just cut that way. And in general, I'm trying to make an, uh, an argument and try to make it sort of carefully, but like the more I bring in, the more likely people critique it and say like, yeah, what about this or that? Like a big, if you like, gap in my book would be the fact that I never make the argument for how memory can actually go back to an event, which is to say, in, by and large, I was arguing that, yeah, people could remember it, but then you can say, well, how do you know they, they just remember that as opposed to it actually goes back to reality? And yeah, that's, I have got a separate journal article. I want to try to work on that, but yeah, like that's actually just pretty controversial. And so you just try to side put it and say, you know, for the sake of right now, I'm just sort of assuming. It. And so similarly with, you know, some of these different details about the creed or some of the backgrounds, I just sort of majored on the major parts and secondary things it, in theory could affect it, but just got to let it go. <laughs> Does your dissertation does your dissertation have like is it affected by say if there was like for example you were mentioning like there's a possibility that there was like a catechesis variety of of memorization that would probably imply that there's more of a lean towards something already been written and written and structured rather than like a shared cultural oral tradition for example whereas some of your other examples lean more to the it could be oral or it could be either way without mattering what's your like with your dissertation does it lean more on the backbone of having a prior written account or actually it doesn't or oral tradition or doesn't matter either way yeah a lot of the time i would take a if this is the case then what would follow and could be said or if it's the other hand what would follow in that case so not, not always too committal there but because yeah in general, I think scholars are saying that the first century was a predominantly oral culture, but with an interaction with written media. So it wasn't just oral, or, you know, just written. It's sort of a combination with both and that. And I guess I'd say we don't have prior written records, but it does say that there are probably teachers in the church. And so in the sort of Jewish culture, teachers were often known for memorizing, I think, even the whole of the Old Testament or a before they're meant to be teaching it the mentor have memorized it and so you'd have that same kind of thing in the church they adopted some of these sort of jewish customs of their culture and the people who could have been involved in catechesis and training and that would have known it uh there are cases of people taking notebooks and making notes beforehand but yeah given that we this is the only and the earliest copy we have of the creed as such i just went with that's what we've got so that's what we'll work with um are you wanting to make another question? well let's so let's get into the the meat like yeah. let's dig in so the creed itself did did you expound systematically through the creed like you brought you broke up the creed christ died buried 
yep. those? Like, did you did you actually break it apart and chronologically go through those three categories of the creed? Yeah, basically, yes. So the book itself has four chapters where the first is like a literature review trying to justify why I'm doing this work, and the last one's a short conclusion, which means it has two roughly 90-page chapters, one of which is basically exegesis of 1 Corinthians 15, and more than half that chapter is on those sort of first, um, well, verses 3 to 7, but I also then cover the rest of the chapter to some degree. And yep, and I'll go through, you know, that Christ died. Yep, that he was buried. Yep, that he appeared and according to the scriptures and things like that. Yep. Are you, um, when, I, when I ask these questions, it sounds like I haven't read it. I, I skim read through it. But are you aware of, say, David Allen Black and N.T. Wright's argument about the, and he rose again? part of the creed but the greek grammar is such that it literally should say and he rose again and is still alive like it's a continual uh -huh. like, like that's part of the creed is is the emphasis it's not that he just rose again but there's a a continual he'll never die again sort of thing um yep yeah, yeah I would, on that note so i engage with roughly i think 1700 sources at least in the book but um, I would say that for the vast majority of them, I only remember them the day that I'm reading them. But for some people like N.T. Wright's work, I would say I've got a decent remembrance and grasp of uh, his. But um, yes, I know like um, Black's work, I did engage with it, but yeah, I couldn't tell you what his view is without just rechecking my book or his work in that sense. But um, yeah, I think in general, you're talking about the term that, the heiress, like he rose, Gyro, and that it's in that tense, like what does that imply? Or do you take it to do more with the aspect uh, in Greek grammar, like, yeah, the tense or the aspect? Yeah, and it has that sort of implications, not just that he is presently risen, but yeah, it's like he is risen with an ongoing force. It's, yeah, and I do make some comments on that. I would um say um, my Greek is okay, but it's not one of my stronger points. <laughs> What about later in the chapter where Paul goes through a uh, sort of like an Occam's razor? If if Jesus didn't rise, then you're all this this whole thing is just a big worthless exercise. Like, how, did you engage with that? Yeah. yeah. Well, interestingly, I'd say the argument structure in First Corinthians fifteen is not like okay, Jesus rose, this or that. He's actually going from, in a sense, verse twenty, saying there's people who deny this. And then he chooses to start his framing of the argument then by saying, hey, we believe in Jesus' resurrection. But it's not like he's arguing for Jesus' resurrection as such. He's saying this is something that you know I spoke to you about when I visited. Uh, we believe this. The other apostles pass this on to me. They teach this as well. So like that's kind of like the established fact. And the reason then he's bringing it up is because, yeah, around about um, verse 20, people are saying that they deny the resurrection. And he's saying, how can you do that if Christ has been raised? Yeah, and that's sort of working in. Even if you like the very last verse, I think 58, talks about how if you don't hold this, it's in vain. And so, yeah, he's as well, that was sort of the motivation, saying like if Christ hasn't been raised, it's in vain. If Christ hasn't been raised, you know, all your everyday labor and toils and stuff like this is in vain as well. Yeah. And I try to give a basic exegesis of the chapter uh, one of my supervisors is you know straight up new testament exegete and it's got great work and so yeah he definitely wanted me to sort of properly handle the text as what it was saying and that not just to sort of jump on what does memory say about it so i did try my best in that regard as well right also the reason why i bring up the uh you know uh the old testament context is because so Heiser, before he passed, the last book that he published before he passed, brought up something from his friend, David Burnett, who wrote uh, an essay on 1 Corinthians 15, apparently saying that there's a matrix of like an intertextual matrix between star-like theosis of Genesis 15 and Deuteronomy 32, and I kid you not, Psalm 82, like, it sounds, it sounds a bit 
far-fetched to make these sort of intertextual connections, but it seems to work, all because Paul seems to quote the Septuagint, or, and, and the Septuagint uses the word anastasis, you know, that we use for resurrection. Yep. So Psalm 82 ends with literally resurrect, O God, to reclaim back the nations. And also in Zephaniah 3, it mentions that the, the, the you know, uh, the, the Great Commission can only happen is if, if Yahweh himself, there's an anastasis, there's a rising up. Paul quotes that in Romans 15. So this is where, this is where I'm going with this. How interesting that they have now a term to use because it's all coming down to this thing called the resurrection. Um, they're seeing their Old Testament. They're seeing, oh, yeah, you know, rising up has these implications. Obviously, they are doing some sort of pesha. But that's where I'm going with this. It's interesting that the, the Old Testament is already there. It's like it's there to be used. And now there's this group, and especially Paul's conversion and his realization, that if the resurrection didn't happen, then even the Old Testament context is just meaningless. It's 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 like all this big build up, like this crescendo, and then it just deflates. Um, so that's again part of the reason why I'm bringing that up. And also, did you engage with, say, the uh, the Messianic pretenders, and maybe I don't know their followings? And uh, I mean, I, I I know that's not again. It's because that in itself would be a, a whole other book. But was that part of your research where um, if they're trying, like, like say if we were to try to defend one of the Messianic pretenders, again, how interesting that they, their movement just didn't really succeed anyway. It's it's, it's already a given. Um, and, and, and yet this movement seems to have succeeded specifically. Yep. Yeah. yeah, got you. That, um, sorry, just got two things there. Again, the first one. Yeah, there's definitely lots of background in there and i think like jewish rabbis were known for doing like purling of where like they go from one passage and it has a connection to another and that fits with things in memory how we have like cues how you may be yeah talking about something and then you it brings you a, a topic you're familiar with like a cue for that and then yeah you continue on and yeah and there's definitely lots of different allusions and backgrounds in there like how you're talking about jesus resurrection uh, died according to the scriptures and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures so yeah that would be sort of natural of them if these are people um if like of the book and they have their life and their language like they do that and i guess modern day would do this as well we often do this with tv shows and movies we make allusions to stuff like this because it's sort of coming to mind as something happens yeah and i guess as for the scriptures in view there there's different positions like some see it as the whole scriptural narrative someone like nt Wright, others see more individual passages come through and you can see it not just in like first corinthians but in like the book of acts several times when they talk about christ being raised they say you know as and it's often with like in a psalm or something it's been predicted and so it's hard to know exactly which one's in view, but it makes sense that it would be in view. And it's not likely saying that it's the scriptures, like they were depressed that Jesus had died in a, in a sense, they're just fabricating, making up. And from reading the scriptures, they thought, hey, no, 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 he must be alive. No, it's more likely the reverse, that this was the language that they lived with. And then now they're seeing that it wasn't just a meaningless death as such, but it was say for our sins according to the scriptures not that he just rose or died and we make it up from the scriptures but like the meaning of that the explanation from that is that and there'd be yeah illusions throughout the passage i know something i didn't think of myself prior to studying this but i came across scholars who see in verse 56 that talks about now the sting of death is sin and the power of the sin is the law they see then in romans like a whole um, chapter basically addressed on this topic and can see how uh, they generally think Corinthians with first Corinthians was written before Romans, but that's how something he developed. And so there is this sort of connection and memory, even within Paul's own writings. Um, yeah. Yep. So, uh, I don't know what else to ask. Because I think we've, <laughs> I mean, that that's, 
that in a nutshell it's uh well okay how about the results i suppose uh what you know if if, if i did you do like a, a bayesian analysis is that even a possibility to, to do in this sort yeah. of work or i did not in the end and i'm fine with that being done um i did ha have so discussion i had um four supervisors such a bit of a long story but in short yeah one of my supervisors was like the only person who really used that is richard carrier and wasn't a fan of richard carrier and said you just don't want to be associated with that and so it was better not to go about that way um but yeah i definitely do think it has merit and it's valid way of doing epistemology but yeah it was not a way i'm employed um it's frowned upon by one of my supervisors yeah well a question that's just come to mind would be um okay so this is paul's uh he, so he's taking this creed and again pentecost is like close to about seven weeks eight weeks after the you know the crucifixion event and 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 in Corinthians, he says that I have come onto the scene like as if I've been stillborn or like come abnormally late sort of thing. And um, yep. Yep. so there's a lot of, again, psychology in Paul in that chapter 15. Uh, don't forget, he's citing the Passover narrative prior to the, even the, the composition of the Gospels, although there are scholars like James Crosley who argue that Mark could be in the 30s, which is a bit really early. But anyway, the point is you have a memory of the Passover event a couple of chapters prior. So it's interesting that Paul is tracking in his own way that, again, the larger, bigger narrative, the theology, the, the ramifications of what this means. What about interconnections with, say, historical Jesus studies, like, say, Daryl Bock's work on... Yep on what's happening and say mark specifically and that like the whole like I, again I, that, I, you have to write a whole lot of the other book to engage in that context but what's your thoughts on that like in other words just the bare bones skeletal jesus historical jesus context what he taught what he did and now paul's argument here yeah yeah sorry i do kind of get you but I might not forget to rephrase that a bit which is to say yep. i definitely think paul like there's been articles written that say what well because there's people who say that yeah paul knows nothing of the historical of jesus to him he's just some sort of like cosmic figure or something and there's people said no you know if you um look through paul's letters there's definitely him affirming parts about jesus life um yeah but sorry i in obviously in first corinthians 15 i'd say he's doing that about Jesus' death and resurrection, and he seems to be doing that in a historical way. And there's a few different opinions there, but in general, that's the thrust. But sorry, your question was more how, how does that play, yeah, sorry? That, in, that, in a, in a, that's based, you, you, you've reworded basically the, the context of my question that I suppose instead of, because usually what Christians do is they read, say the gospels, and then they go into, to use like Islamic uh, analogy, you, you, you know, the gospels are like the Quran and then the Hadith, is like Paul's writings. <laughs> so what if we were to do it the reverse, like have, say, Paul's writings first in the New Testament, and then when you finish his writings, now you read a biography of Jesus, the bios, right? Say, Mark, do you think there would be contradictions or memory lapses, uh, embellishments to emphasize maybe what Paul's getting at? Obviously, again, it doesn't mean Paul is influencing say mark's gospel or the author of mark and but what like what 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 would the chapter 15 do to other sections of the new testament i i, I suppose is is my, my okay question. yeah yeah got you yeah Definitely. you often you often hear like does paul you know have awareness of these events i actually haven't thought too much about how much the gospel authors know of say first corinthians but I guess I would say they should have known of the creed because I guess the claim is it is the common early traditions of the early Christians. Yeah, and I guess one of the comments I make, a weakness of this view is that the creed is like really well known and really early and people like this, is how come we don't have sort of clear reports then of what the story was for each of these? So like the appearance to Peter or even to James or to the 500, depending where we put them, 
I mean, to the 12 and to the, all the apostles, it's hard to know which one it is, but we do have several of the appearances in Matthew, Luke, or John that could be the one, yeah, to the 12 or the, all the apostles. Some have said that to all the 500 corresponds to the last one in Matthew 28, uh, where Jesus gives the Great Commission. But yeah, and so a weakness would be like, if this was the early Korean tradition, why don't we get a longer testimony and account of that there? So I do touch on that a tiny bit. Um, I think that's a valid thing to bring up. But um, yeah, it wouldn't, I think, be decisive one way or another. It's, it's like, yeah. You know, one thing actually, I wouldn't mind asking your thoughts on. So yeah, not sure yeah, if you've read um, page. 64 of my book that's talking about the appearance to Paul is so there was a scholar who um, I can't remember his name right now, but if it's looking it up myself was our last name, Scott. Uh, he talks about how this could have some allusion to some of the giant passages. Yeah. And so I basically write here that the term ectoma literally refers to an shall abortion I, or miscarriage. Shall I bring it up? Like share my screen. Uh, yep, yep. Yeah, you're welcome so, yep. to. All right, let's do that. Uh, this page. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah I think yeah, up, I think not so much the footnotes. Sorry, I have too many footnotes on my. So yeah, oh, just right. that yeah. sort of part here, yeah. saying the term yeah, ectroma refers yeah. literally to an abortion or miscarriage. Yeah. One suggestion yeah. is that the expression is an allusion to the giant Ahoya from the Book of Giants, and so the verse. In 1 Corinthians 15, 8, presupposes a courtroom scene in which Paul, the persecuted and enemy of Christ, stands trial before Christ for his crimes, but experiences radical grace instead of acknowledged condemnation. So, yeah, that was one scholar, and I'm just sort of reporting on how yeah, his scholarship could apply to that, and it was uh, not well known, I guess, of other comments there. And I did look up some of the, you know, this Book of Giants, this text myself, but... um. Yeah, that was interesting. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Like, I don't remember seeing say hi as a commenting on this particular one, but I'm not as well versed that I would just, it yeah. would in my mind. Yeah, so, okay. I'm familiar with the, like, I've done a lot of work in, you know, the Book of the Giants stuff, plus also the Qumran utilization of certain passages in, in Job that speak about the etymological nature of Nephilim. So, Nafila, the Aramaic, you know, there's debate. Does Nephilim come from Nafal to fall and hence the fallen ones? Or why did the Septuagint translators have it as Gigorim, uh, meaning, you know, giants? And so Heiser will argue, oh, the, the, the morphology of the word will fit not the Nafal verb, but uh, when you look at the way the Aramaic utilization of Nafila, which means giant, when you when you look when you transpose that back into Hebrew and it's sort of like a retrograde you know retrojected backwards so to speak uh, morphologically the, the the word Nephilim does mean giant doesn't mean fallen it just means giant or some sort of like as Genesis six four says the men of renown the men of the name then Enoch goes into very interesting again the big larger narrative of uh, so I, I recommend uh, I'll bring back your page in a moment so yeah, you yeah. can see me. Uh, I recommend Ama Anas's 2010 work called On the Origin of the Watchers. It's a journal for the pseudepigraphical, you know, journal. And what he does is, is that he traces the Mesopotamian background. So this, what's called the Apkalo myth. Like, why did Genesis, why does Genesis 6 exist to begin with? And interestingly enough, Genesis 6, 1 to 4 is like its own creed. <laughs> it's like, I kid you not, it's just like the creed in 1 Corinthians 15. It's it's like it's like a creedal statement that that gives you the 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 logical reasons for from verse five onwards why there's corruption in the earth and hence this flood and so then you, so yeah the ancient Near Eastern workings the polemics there then Second Temple Jews so first Enoch is important because it, it, before the discovery of Ugarit you know the Ugaritic material. First Enoch happens to be a very interesting bridge. And then when we discover the material, it's like, hey, they're right on the money. Somehow this material has survived into the second temple period. Hence, New Testament authors are, are going, 
you know, headstrong with that narrative. I, 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 so another study I recommend, it's by a guy named Tyler Stewart. With respect to, it's a 2022 publication, a dissertation on the origin of evil in Galatians. So what he does is that he goes to Galatians 3.19 and Galatians 4. So in 3.19 it says, well, why was the Torah added? And then it says, because of transgressions, plural. Well, the transgressions, plural for Second Temple Jews is to do with the giants and the, the, the multiple falls that's transpired. And then if you have, you know, the people groups that are under the subjugation of gods, then the Torah happens to be designed as an ancient Near Eastern law code that accommodates that larger context. It's not just, so, so what Tyler Stewart says, too much in the reform circle context that are obviously like Calvin and so on that are far removed from the second temple discussions that scholarship now is discovering. We, we apply what's called an Adamic template on law language. Tyler Stewart says, no, we should apply an Enochian template. And so therefore notice Galatians four goes straight into this. He was born by a woman, born under the law adopted us to become sons of God. Note it's a very interesting reversal language of the sons of God with women, Nephilim, now the son of God through a woman, and now we become the adopted sons of God to replace, you know, it's, 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 an, it's a, like when you have that perspective in mind, it's like, oh, okay, that actually unlocks a lot of the murkiness that the Adamic template usually has. So now in Corinthians, Specifically in chapter 11, are you aware of the peculiar, again, giant sort of polemics with the head covering? I, sh I think we've discussed this before, but right. no, I guess because it's major. major. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, by the way, for the sake of time, I won't go there, yeah. but basically yeah. Yeah. because of the angels, the head covering issue. So uh, chapter 15 goes into celestial flesh, this theosis, you know, what does resurrection look like? Now, courtroom scene is interesting because um, if you're taking divine counsel imagery from like, say, Daniel 7, Psalm 82, obviously, first Enoch is full of that. And Enoch, as uh, this, this hypothetical character in the book, is in a courtroom scene before the son of man who's on the throne and the other watchers that are judged and so on. What I find interesting is that um, the, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of just spitballing in a conjectural way. I'll have to dig into this, but yep. based on what I know and my, my reactions on, on the spot, if it is, if, if Paul's trying to say that he's in like a courtroom setting, if, if that's what he meant by this, by the term, you know, coming late, well, it's interesting that Daniel seven, when it says that the son of man that comes on the clouds is, is escorted into the courtroom of the Ancient of Days. And again, you see this in Enoch. Enoch is escorted with an entourage before the Son of Man on the throne. Well, it sounds like I'm not surprised by that because if Paul is having, like he says in Second Corinthians, whether I was, you know, he speaks about himself in like the third person. Uh, I yeah. like I went into like some sort of divine yeah, chapter council, 12. you know. It's like, that's now, if that's what's happening here in first Corinthians, that's a pretty powerful, <laughs> like, high yes, I'll, be tripping if, 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 you know, yep. I'm just yeah. sort of reporting that in my work. I didn't take a thing. I thought it was interesting. Someone sees yeah. just sort of connection, that term, just sort of in the book of the giants, and I guess, Paul then having awareness and how he might describe himself right. as that kind of figure. Yep. So that, but that would, that would fit with what. Tyler Stewart would call an Enochian template that's right there in that statement. Um, but I'm definitely going to dig into that. Yeah. Yep. I'm sorry to put your hands right there, but it's something to look into. Yeah. 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 No, that, that, no, that's, that's pretty good. But that, again, that's, that's connected to, again, think about it. Like, like it, it goes to show that if that's true, these people are very careful thinkers in regards to how do we make the best sort of a, you know, you, you can't just spend thousands and thousands of pages discussing Jesus resurrect. 
like how do we like fine tune a document that's sufficient you know in this case a letter right yeah like they're tracking with all this prior material is my point and if let's just go along with the thesis specifically where you're going with this like let's just say like what are the results of your your work uh, yeah. negative memories yeah. positive memories uh whether a bit of both like what 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 were the results in light of everything we're discussing yeah got you so yeah so half the work is just saying just sort of exegesis the text trying to rightly understand it saying you know what did paul mean by that yeah and then it basically says uh what would memory mean for that i mean some people i think would complain and say wasn't memory already affecting exegesis in small ways it does but in general i would say uh like a scholar like uh tumis hovercane so i probably mispronounced his name but his book the quest for the memory of jesus basically says that yeah memory approach doesn't stand on our own it has to be used alongside some kind of lens to read the text which you can call historical criticism or historical exegetical method or something like this so that's really what the first chapter does so then the third chapter then we'll uh, sort of apply that and it really does it just on a bit by bit step so i've identified 21 factors of memory that you could apply and some are going to have less relevance than others but i mean just kind of going in order almost so one of them would just be transience and just says look how well you remember what you had for breakfast today is easier than if it was a week ago you know a month ago yeah and so i say you know based upon that you know if the creed is a certain date it would mean that or if the letter is at a certain date it'd mean that yeah and in the sense that's pretty boring it's just sort of one factor another factor would be then that that was for say just typical memories but if you have more significant things like if we asked you know what did you have for breakfast at christmas or whatever you may be able to remember that one even though it is like three months four months ago or something like that so that can be a factor and that's, that'd be like a major one which is to say you know if a resurrection happened it's not going to be an everyday thing yep so that would bring that but yeah there's yeah other factors as well and so i guess it, it's kind of a mixed bag in that sense so i'm saying some of them would say like the flashbulb one would say yeah you know had it happened it's very likely they could remember but other ones may say hey this could give reason to doubt and it's not so sure an example there would be on paul's health uh, like it says generally people in good health can remember things better than ones who aren't so well and so i basically chose to be agnostic i said about paul's health in the sense that yes he's traveling around he's speaking of that he's in good health but he's also someone who's been like whipped shipwrecked uh stoned and stuff like that so you know you could debate uh thing either way and so i said you know that's not super clear so i guess it's going to depend on the factor i guess probably the more interesting thing you say for what i found um so there's something there's four different philosophical theories of what it is to remember something and it may depend on what and there's different people that advocate different ones um one of my supervisors also was like you've got to pick one and go with it i was trying to cover all four and they end up allowing me to uh, cover two um, one of them is known as the epistemic theory of remembering and it's basically uh you know epistemology study of knowledge you might say how do you know something and the general view not everyone takes this but it's that if you know something you can call it justified true belief yep and that's to say you have to believe it uh it has to be true and you have to be warranted for believing it at that time and so you basically say the same thing about that like you know did paul actually think that jesus rose i don't want to say yes you know it appears he's been sincere uh was he warranted in believing it at the time and in general i would want to say i can see how arguments could be made either way like someone could say like the fact that he fell to the ground he was blind like that's an indication um you know if you take the book of acts as representative of what's happening in first corinthians 15 8 where he says you know jesus appeared to me yeah so someone could say like that's he wasn't warranted but others in general would say like he was in good health and stuff like this so yep but yeah i guess the question then comes did jesus rise from the dead and as far as sort of memory goes, I don't think you could be clear cut and give a case for that. There's different things you come into play. Like you could say that the flashbulb nature of a memory should give you reason to think then that it, it's not only just warranted, but that had it happen, um, 
it likely goes back to that memory. Like the best explanation for why we have these various people claiming that is not a lie, is not that they mistaken identity, but Jesus really rose. And so, yeah, I do think you could go that route. And then having said that, that's just to say people would have knowledge of Jesus' resurrection. And then you have to ask then in our case, could they remember it? And then, yeah, there's be various factors you're saying then that over this, over the creed's length, and even if you said the creed was super early, let's just say six months, and then you've still got to say that it's been passed around in the Christian community and tradition for roughly 19 years, let's say, and six months. So you still got like a 20 year period. So you've got the reliability of a memory for six months and then again for 19 years. Yeah. And so I look at those general factors. Uh, the things I look at is like the length, like how long can you remember something? And generally, psychologists would say that people can remember five to seven, uh, yeah, is it, yeah, five plus or minus two items. Um, and actually, in general now, uh, psychologists have got more conservative and said, no, it's probably only three um, items. So, yeah, abilities have gone down. <laughs> but, um, and then I say, like, yeah, well, how would that work for the creed? And it depends where, how long you think the creed is, because some thinks, some scholars say it stops at verse five, some say verse seven. So, like, you know, I count the words in Greek, or I consider then maybe is essentially are you just trying to remember what you call memory chunking or grouping. Like, it's say that that Christ died, that he was buried, that he was raised, that he appeared. So, in a sense, that's like four things rather than every single w word of, that Christ died according to scriptures and that he was buried and he was raised. Yeah. And that, which would be longer, but yeah, there are studies that said that some people can remember, I actually forget precisely here, but I think 30 plus words and it can fit within that is to say in general, like if you're asking, sorry, it's a way too long answer, but you know, what am I sort of finding oh, no, is I'd Keep say going. that the yeah. various factors that need to be considered are important, but on the whole, I still think it gives good reason to think, that you know had jesus really risen uh that would make sense of the fact that this is how it's been reported and that and they could remember it yeah it's the basic thrust yeah. what what about uh, uh, if you have a question go for it but i was just going to quickly ask what about uh, if you're talking about remembering you know three at, at, at most or at least three things or something like that what about like a rhyming nature of the creed so so again, David Allen Black will argue that there's a lot in the New Testament letters, like the Carmen Christi hymn. I mean, notice I, I, I've automatically just said it's a hymn. So there's, there's debate, if, is it a hymn? Is it a poem? Is it... But the point is, I've even seen arguments for this creed in Corinthians as being some sort of like, like it's it's very uh, truncated, very, like, and you pointed out earlier, you're saying it could be a longer one, but it's 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 designed to be basically memorized i suppose like it's it's you know yeah and i like the carmen christi hymn although he's in the form of god he had empty you notice that the way it flows um is that something that is very applicable here yeah that is like a factor that come in and to say that several scholars have mentioned that there's probably some sort of rhyme or meter to the creed though it's not as clear as some may like to make it like there's definitely evidence of it but i don't think it's like a clear-cut case and i think if you were to make that you'd probably be more likely saying that yeah the creed also ends at verse five which is to say the appearance is like to the 500 some of who uh, remain although some have fallen asleep like that you know that would seem to be breaking the meter as such and i guess you could see that as just an insertion by paul or something which yeah i do actually talk about like are there ways that memory could explain how that could have come in from Paul or something like that? But I mean, dare I say right now, I would say even if he did add that some now sleep, it, it wouldn't deny the fact that there was a clear memory of that it was to 500. Yeah, it's not like that was explained as an addition or something like that. Just a quick comment about the 500, not connected, yep. but I came across a Brill paper published about two, three years ago, very interesting argument that it may not be 500. It could be a cipher that the Greek that we translate 500 could be a cipher for just holy. So, and he appeared to all the holy brothers, not 
that he appeared to all the fight that like he appeared to 500 i i don't yeah. know if you came across that but i found that interesting in other words it opens the door to it's not like a limited like 500 you know and then you usually see the online uh <laughs> the wild west of the online youtube culture where there's this well then who who are these so-called 500 right and why is just the five the term 500 just thrown out um I don't know. I, 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 I found yep, that. Yep. Actually, I actually want to say off the top of my head, I don't remember coming across that one. So happy to like send I'll, that away and I can I'll send check a, a bit further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess some I guess of the some things thing I've seen is some people might have said it was just 500 men, like feeding to 500 if it was uh, 5,000, if it was to 5,000 men plus women and children. So it's that sort of remark. Some people say that the appearance to the 500s should have said, over instead of like it was in the skies above the 500 and stuff i discussed some of that stuff as well but yeah i don't remember the cypher one yeah 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 Over it. that's uh, yeah. <laughs> um before i forget because i have a terrible terrible memory <laughs> that's a good memory right? absolutely shocking memory like the lowest percentile of people who can remember anything is mine um this culture memorized like like they had really really good rote memory and and um an oral memory that they would have learned from a very early age so that would have been that would have expanded their ability to memorize things from rote or oral but would that also extend to events or is that like a separate sort of category of like memorization from the brain like from a neurological perspective i guess are there separate sort of ways of remembering things like for example if i'm very good at remembering like narnia or something can i also remember events better therefore or are they separate sort of thing yeah got yeah. you so yeah a few good thoughts there i don't want to say i don't feel like i have the greatest memory either um i do in this, the book consider this people who have to seem to have like um forget the precise term there you go i don't have the great memory but basically like superhuman memory yeah, and then you could say, well, hey, maybe Paul or one of the apostles are the, or one of the authors of the Gospels was that, and that's why we can really trust their memory of that. And I would guess that's possible, but there's no specific claim being made about that as such. So, you know, I don't think we should just automatically apply that. And it's like based upon regular human memory, what could we tell? But, yeah, the things you said, like the culture uh, being known for memorization, I think, like, yes, so they would have practiced it and had an emphasis on it, which would help. Um I don't, from, I guess, the studies that I've seen, I wouldn't want to say that, like, people then just in general had better memories. Like, I would say 2,000 years of biology would probably not that much different. And there's studies today of people who live in, like, oral cultures, and at first they tend to say, like, wow, these people can remember stuff really well. Though the general conclusions have been that it's about the practice of it, which is to say if you practice it and something like you can learn and improve that as well and it's generally things that was of interest to them which is to say they had interest in their sort of like uh village traditions but today we often say we have interest in like sport or something like this and people can remember all these facts and games and of that, that people have played um so yeah but i mean a few other things just on your comment of like yeah if you can remember one thing to another yeah it's more i guess going to be based upon i think your repetition of the particular thing you want so you may know narnia well because you've read a lot and practiced that and that and there's also even memory techniques uh which pretty much the techniques we use today are the ones which those sort of the ancient greeks use and i guess given that's the greco-roman culture um of which some of this was happening there's reason to think that can be in play as well um although you know, it may not have been but like it could have been and it would help remember um Yes, I feel like gone on a bit, but the kind of factors you're listing in that would just would come into play. Yeah, and did, did you have something? Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely wasn't saying that we have they had better memories than us, like biologically, but just because they practice memory, yeah. like memorization, they probably have like you know how that you've got like that neuroplasticity where if you work on certain areas of your brain yeah. or certain skills then that becomes easier for your brain, you know, recall or memory or something like that. So if they practice that from such an early age onwards, then they're actually better at it just because of that, those pathways being used more regularly than say me, for example, 
we can't remember chapters and verses of anything even in the Bible. <laughs> but but just to jump based on what you just said, mm -hmm. and now let's like give an example. So I'm thinking of something like say Mark nine, where you have the transfiguration. Okay, let's pretend that's just all legend, and okay, because let's pretend to be like I don't know yep. atheists or agnostics or something. But as Jesus is coming down, there's already a debate and discussion based on their already in the moment sort of like when you said village traditions and so on wait what do you mean the messiah has to die and what do you mean that the resurrection will happen in time isn't the resurrection this theological hope of the end like it's all meant to happen at the end not like in history but at the end of history so that's yes. it's already a push against what is already memorized i suppose what they expect, and then the whole Jesus narrative just upsets the whole system, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that is sort of right. That's the kind of thing that they're trying to make sense of in, in the categories. And in general, I guess there were probably different, there were different views on what the Messiah would be. I think the popular notion is that it'd be sort of a military conquering Messiah. And I think there's different re scholars say different things like some say it's the mark's messianic secret that mark just put it in it was never there but i'd say the general view well it's not a general view there's so many different views but a view which i like is that uh jesus was the messiah but he was a particular kind of messiah and it wasn't that popular one and so he has to sort of slowly be introducing it to them yeah and i would say in general that's why he preferred the term the son of man it was a less sort of loaded cultural term and he could put his own meaning into what uh was the son of man and like that but yep and it's the same you're talking here about in mark 9 them that him having a resurrection prediction that's sort of just done their categories and that's sort of him introducing it and i guess i'd say ultimately they, they didn't really grasp it before he rose which is say it was still confusing but i mean it does say they remembered later and that would fit with what we know of memory that they would now after his resurrection say hey we've remembered how he said this yeah we didn't grasp it it was yeah and that's in out of our categories well. yeah 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 that that's in the text like now we remember why he said this it's like <laughs> these editorial notes that yeah yeah and also don't forget in luke 24 he has jesus has to open their minds to understand say the old testament yep and yep. now they're just running around exegeting the old testament with like a jesus focus um yeah 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 i think that's spot on yeah and i do comment on some of that so yeah it's good uh would you like to take some audience questions quickly if anyone has questions feel free to throw them in otherwise um yeah um yeah, I, I'd like to hear you talk about social contagion of memory that you've got here. And this is like basically a blurb. In of number your book six. Yeah. On number six, the social contagion of memory. Yep. Yeah. yeah. While well, talking about um, not having the best memory, I'm the type of person who wants to get the definition from it as well. So, yeah, okay, social contagion so. refers to false memories implanted by social influence. Yeah. yeah. And I guess you'd say it is false memories, but in general, the phenomenon is saying that you may remember it a particular way, but because you hear other people speaking and saying it, uh, you then change your memory because of them. And this is going to be related to other factors like suggestion. Yep, I guess it's just a particular type of that. And I'd also want to positively say then that studies have been done to say that this basic phenomenon of hearing other people can also correct false memories which is to say someone may have said it was this but on talking to others they can also sort of change their memory uh, that so it doesn't just have to be negatively although it does sound that but yeah basically then i just try to think about how this could apply uh and yeah a few that i get from the book then is to say that in general people are more likely to have social contagion for stuff that they're unsure of uh, but if it's something that yeah they're like no nah, i really thought that happened it's less likely to happen so in a sense this things in the creed i think are in general less likely to be influenced by social contagion whereas if you were to say stuff like yeah was it still dark or 
how many women were at the tomb and stuff like that. That's something that, yeah, if you heard someone said, oh, it was the two, the two Marys or the three or this, that, that's more likely to be like a little bit less clear. And so you could see how that could come into play to there. But in general, for things like the creed, because it is short, has rhyme and meter and stuff like this, it's less likely uh, in general to do that. Or like, you know, get in the creed, if we've got the appearance of the 500, uh, we don't know this, but, you know, even if 10 of the 500 were like, yeah, I'm not sure that's what happened, you'd still in a sense have 490 saying, no, I think this generally did happen. So, and I'm saying we don't actually have any other reports of the 500, so we wouldn't strictly know whether it was 10 or one or that we've just got that appearance but it's to say that this is probably not a factor that should cause us to doubt the information uh in the creed yeah what about i think the, the, uh the baptism of the dead so i was always confused yep. with that passage but my favorite interpretation and i'm open to other ideas but so far heiser did a good amalgamation of a particular study that argued that people were being baptized on behalf of the hope so this is coming now to memory stuff to the hope of resurrection because of jesus resurrection right so people were becoming christian like take your i don't know your your the hero in the faith you know so for me it would be i don't know, say david paulson or something so i become christian because of david paulson now he dies and therefore my conversion is such that well baptism is the is the requirement and so therefore i'm going to be baptized but it's in the context of the fact that that man uh helped me become or have you know help he discipled me into having the faith and so therefore i'm being baptized on behalf of quote unquote the dead which is what has happened to Pawson. but the i'm i'm being baptized because i know that just as baptism symbolically showcases a rising up out of the water right Ergo, I become Christian because I have that hope, because I know that David Paulson will rise. So that's one interpretation I've had. I don't know what interpretation you've had, or if that's relevant to um, yeah. your thesis. Yeah. No, well, I did. It's in the chapter. I did want to comment on it, although sorry, this film may feel like I took the chicken's way out. And that is to say, I said there were roughly 10 different views, and it was pretty hard to know. But I basically said then, you know, so how is it functioning in this passage? And it's basically saying, if Christ um, has not been raised, why would we be doing these things? Which is to say, he is raised. That's why we do that. So exactly what it's referring to, yeah, there's different views, which I list and cover. But I just say it's functioning as sort of support and evidence for the resurrection. That's the main um, takeaway I take of it. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. yeah, if you want, actually, I before just mentioned social contagion of memory, one thing that comes to mind was how I said that the sum have fallen asleep. Yeah, so that's something I suggest. Maybe that could creep in because the social contagion of memory, basically, where originally Paul was maybe at, like, the Galatia talking to them and saying, you know, that he appeared to... Kephas, then to the 12 and he appeared to 500 and someone's like where's the 500 and he's like well some remain but some have fallen asleep and so that could like have crept in there not saying as such that it's all whole things false memory but just that would explain how that phrase of it could creep into the tradition mm, right so with um with say social contagion of memory the 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 larger the group say of these 500 the more they're able to iron out in discussion like m sort of make a like narrow the the narrative down a bit because there's more discussion or will that actually make it usually more difficult to more people because i'm actually thinking of these social contagion false memory sort of things is reminding me of that phenomena that people have labeled the Mandela effect. And it's where yeah. everyone on the internet's decided certain things about something and it's nonsense, basically. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a related thing as well. I did touch. Um, actually, I'm not sure if that made the final, but I've read up on the Mandela effect and stuff like that. And just this, whether you call it social contagion, Mandela effect, suggestibility, or memory conformity, it's these kind of factors at play about just how the different stories come into that. And I'm basically saying that, yeah, it's a factor you'd consider. And the sense in which, well, obviously, if there's just two of you there's, who had witnessed the thing, then there's only one other person who could affect or cause contagion to your memory, such that if there's 100 of you, there's been more people. But I guess it also means then that it's less likely that the 100 are going to get the whole thing wrong. But it is more likely that any distinctive feature that you have that the group is not reporting is that you'll end up going, yeah, that must have been wrong. And you'll have like a common group story. It's sort of is would you, would you say this is venturing into like a weird first century peer reviewing <laughs> maybe it could yeah be it is and i think it can be a bit speculative to sort of yeah to yeah. do that but i guess we're just trying to see then are there possible effects of that um in general like again with social contagion you're less likely to be influenced by someone who you consider more unreliable and so in the first century culture i said that women were sadly not seen as not necessarily that they were unreliable witnesses but they weren't as credible as men and which is to say their sort of version of the events is less likely to influence than someone who has a more patriarchal kind of view and so that could be one reason why you see less of that like maybe why they're not mentioned in the creed right. um, That's, as yeah. well because they wanted to say hey we're not sure about that but the firm facts like yeah like yeah. Hmm. although the yeah, that's and that's an interesting point because, again, coming back to the question earlier where I said, uh, "What if, like, like a what if we read Paul's letters first, then when we get to the biography of Jesus, you know, the famous apologetic argument, oh, the women, uh, they are the first ones, uh, not only coming to the tomb but also leaving and and then telling everyone we've seen the Lord, um, and then." then you had jesus appearing to these select folk right i suppose a question i could have is that whether you take 500 there as a cipher for holy which now becomes an unknown number or literally 500 it can't all be just 500 men it, it, it you would you would expect like a like a gender di differentiation in that number so yeah, yeah. Yeah. I do discuss some of that in there, which is to say, some people say because all the other appearances are to men, maybe that was men as well. Although in general, just the term there of not the number 500, but it's like 500 people, that term generally refers to men and women. And so that's actually the route I go. So it's 500 group of believers, both male and female, men and women. Yeah. 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 yeah this could lead down to so many rabbit holes of <laughs> like i could yeah, no, i could yeah. talk still for ages about how for example um how they were taught memory and memorization techniques but then you did mention briefly that's much the same as we did um you did also mention briefly like at the start that they possibly used other media not just written not just oral tradition unless those were the two things that we were talking about in like categorically but is it possible that they also had early artworks done of it almost straight away as they were sort of going and, and like creating art regarding what they'd seen, their experiences to help them, maybe not just to help them remember per se, but just because it was something that took their interest and their fancy and they had more free time than we have these days? <laughs> Yep. Actually, that thought on whether they had artwork, I'm not really too sure myself there. So that would be something to think about further. But generally, just the notebooks, like were there other things that were written down, that sort of discussed. Yeah, and that often comes into play because I think it's Papias says that Matthew wrote first and that, and some people have said maybe had Aramaic notes or something like this that have come in too. But yeah, I guess that's, as you said, we've got our many different ways. And so my work is not like the definitive thing. That's the discussions closed. In that sense, it's really the first work that's tried to apply memory to Jesus' resurrection. And I tried to advance 
the memory approach a bit, but I'm building on others. And I would uh, hope that others would sort of go to down that route as well. Um, fine for people who critique it as well and say, you know, that's not the best way. You can go, still do other routes. But um, I think there could be some insights. And so, yeah, just trying to start raising them. And it's effectively only on First Corinthians 15, which is say you can more carefully apply that lens to the Gospels and Acts and the rest of Paul's letters and stuff like that or later texts. So, yeah, by all means, people can say I don't do the best, but hopefully it's still a launching pad to think about it further. I'll put you on the spot. Uh, Habermas's four-volume work yep. is released volume one. Either your thoughts or have you looked into it or is Habermas familiar with your dissertation on this context or has has he also because i haven't read it so i don't know if he's touched on memory work and is like he's, he's he's argued that something like 70 percent of of it within the whole four volumes is like brand new material that he's never published before and so yep yes i'm only about 20 percent of the way which i mean still feels like 200 pages that's about i think my book's less than 200 pages but um so i can't fully I'll uh, say, but yeah, I'm working through it as such. And yeah, I did also see like an interview where he made that comment. I've also seen posts of people saying, look, no, this is from here and here and here. So it can be debated. I guess to me, that probably doesn't matter too much. Maybe he has reworked and that, and sometimes like your mind does that. You just naturally use some of your same points, but you know, you're still updating it. And the fact that you've updated, make new points in some ways it is fresh and new. But yeah, I'm finding it, it's like, I'm looking forward in general to his work. I think he's done a good contribution. The fact that it's so detailed is in some ways a positive and negative, which is say it'd be great to do that, but it is a bit of effort and time, you know, to get through. Um, yes. What also does he know my work? So I did email him in early days to say if he knew something and I have sent him a copy of my book and actually today he um, sent me an email saying that he's received it. So that's very kind of him. And so, yeah, you can get his take on it uh, eventually. But um, have master's work, I guess the first one is the evidences. And so he's basically just going through the text and sort of see what different sc scholars. And so, yeah, I think that's in general a good contribution. He's known for the minimal facts approach and the stuff, I guess, in the 200. I've mainly worked through the methodology stuff mainly so far. And um, I don't feel it's, it is worth saying what's the best method to study this, but I don't think it's something that you have to like die over and then probably, is, you know, some methods are going to have some value either. And I think I'm used to seeing people say, look, minimal facts is what is like the scholar, 80, 90% of scholarship say, and you affirm that. Like he states, um, I think it was roughly page 90, that it's really the strength of the argument. And even if the majority aren't affirming that, then you should still hold to it because there's good strength argument. So there's a sense in which in this newer volume, if the minimal facts is known for you need 80, 90% of the consensus, I would say he's slightly moving away from that, just saying for the strength of the argument, what's that? Uh, and he also then, I often hear that like, a maximal data approach or we look at sort of the general reliability of the new testament and saying this is the claim made in a reliable document so what's that and he actually says that they can go hand in hand that you can have these specific uh, arguments for a minimal fact alongside a sort of general thing so that's some of that but i guess i haven't finished reading it so i can't make too many comments but in general i'm yeah I definitely appreciate it of both this current work he's done and the, he's done a lot of good work in the past as well. Yeah, Sweet. there's a few there's a few questions in the chat. Um, this question was regarding the conversation we had earlier in the stream about Paul's um, how much Paul knew about the Gospels prior to his preaching, like say after his conversion. So therefore, the the question is as simple as, well, if he suddenly came across Jesus and he didn't meet Jesus during his earthly ministry, then wouldn't he just ask the people who did? So, Yeah, but, uh, uh, in a sense, I'm based... 
Oh, no, go, go for David and then I'll... Yeah, and the way I'd basically say that is correct, which is to say, like in First Corinthians 15 says, this is what I received, which is to say other people did uh, tell him about it and that. And I guess there's a question of when. I mean, some scholars could say that he actually heard like a Stephen uh, talking about it even before Paul had converted. So he didn't learn the creed later, say, in um, a lot of people corresponded with... Um, Galatians chapter one, where he went to Jerusalem to visit Peter and James, but you could even argue it was before, like he did hear people talking about it and that. And yes, I'd say that's basically on track. Yep. I, yep. If you want to get technical as well, there, you might say the, I would be arguing for that. He learned the creed from other Christians, but the experience, he still had a revelation of Jesus and encounter on the road to Damascus, but I don't, I know a few people do, but yeah, I'm not one of the people who thinks that Jesus, when he appeared to Paul, told um, Paul the creed, as we found that. The content of the creed he learned from other people, like this person saying, but yeah, he did have a experience as well of fear. I suppose the question I have on that is, um, this would be an interesting litmus test for... I. I I would find it more interesting if Paul was completely just his own thing. So in other words, you have the Gospels that, if if you take Q as a legit thing, and Mark, scholars like Mark Kodak is like, nah. But anyway, the point is you have this Jesus tradition, right? And then there's Paul. It would be an interesting litmus test if, as per Galatians, Paul has this weird scenario happen to him, and he's like, oh boy, I'm, I'm familiar with the so-called Jesus movement, because I persecuted them, because they claim Yahweh became flesh and all that, right? So he goes to them and exchanges notes. <laughs> this is, this is my, uh, this is, this is my uh, distilling down and, and trying to make sense of this experience I've had. What's your re reaction? Uh, I mean, if that actually happened, and and the Jesuses don't contradict, you know, the the Jesus of the the Jerusalem folk, and then Paul, the the Jesus of Paul, if it's the same Jesus, you know, that's hence the welcoming context, right? But if if it's not the same Jesus, then then Paul needs to be excluded out, right? So. Yep. yep. Yeah, I don't really get into the discussion, but there are scholars who say, did Paul even know Jesus um, during his life? So, but yeah, but that's... Yep, uh, so next question. Once you memorize or come to an understanding of what is believed to be the core facts, how much would you, how much would need to be memorized? Um, a lot of teachings similar to how Corinthians and Thessalonians have similar language about the same subject but tell it from different points they could be from the same person that understood resurrection but didn't just repeat something memorized right yeah i guess with the term memorization there can be verbatim literal word for word or you can have you know i generally have memorized i know the gist of it and both in the sense would sort of cover there yeah so creed in general would probably fit into the category of something that you would be attempting to memorize word for word whereas maybe the parable of the prodigal son or something like this i mean you could argue that as well for word for word but i think in general that's probably more like a, a gist of story that you remember and there may be cases where it has a bit of both um an example would basically just be like a punchline of any joke where you can build it up and you can still have, yeah, I've memorized this joke to use and prepare. I'm saying, that, and there can be stories I think you'd see in the Gospels that fit this, where there's like a punchline to it that is probably likely a word for word bit. The larger section may not be. And there's, in that sense, just yeah, different models of oral transmission that scholars have put forth. Generally, there's different categories, but what's known as the formal controlled spectrum and you can have it in either formal or informal or controlled or uncontrolled and a combinations of that as such and and then there'd be certain traditions that are yeah perhaps more likely memorized verbatim and then some less and i 
you I think mentioned Bart Erdman before, you know, he generally is on that less spectrum of saying like someone had learnt it, which you could say memorized it in a gist sense, but then they told their neighbor who told their friend's wife, who told like their dog, and then like that's how it came along. What about motivations? Like, so you can you can remember something. So, for example, something that's not like nonsensical, like flat Earth. I I can memorize a flat Earth argument. It doesn't mean I'll I'll be motivated to, to go out of my way to, uh, you know, make an apologia about it, right? Yeah, you got you, and I think you're right there. That sort of motivation, and that's to say. Um, like Kenneth Bailey, who was one of the people known for doing this oral transmission studies, makes that point right from the beginning that there's different like genres of material and the sort of hearsay gossip, yeah, that's in that unimportant category. It's uh, informal, it's uncontrolled. Yep. But there are sort of key village traditions. And in general, then, yeah, you would be saying that a lot of this stuff about Jesus is like, he healed a blind man, he rose from the dead. Um, and that's in a different category. That's of its important, its motivation, like Paul's sort of saying in first Corinthians, again, this is what we taught. And if Christ has not been raised, it turns out that we have misrepresented God and, you know, we're most to be pitied. So this, yeah, just isn't in the category of unmotivated, unimportant. This is of first things that has eternal consequence to them and they would see you know if they're misrepresenting god they're like blasphemers which was something actually mattered to them in their culture yeah that's a good point actually actually that's a good point about how the creed starts that's that no i'm th thank you for reminding me because it says <laughs> this is of utmost remember when i share with you that is which of utmost importance the creed yeah right so yeah yeah um next question had a question uh what's your thoughts on dale c jr allison on his reinterpretation on the earlier eyewitnesses had a literal vision of christ yeah, yeah. i'm just trying to get that so dale allison was one oh he his book uh from 2021 I just remember which year it came out yeah it was the main book that i interact with i guess because he's a very good scholar and it came out recently and what well, came out actually partway through my studies, but fairly early on as such, because yeah, it's always like annoying if you're like almost finished and then some brilliant work comes out. But um, it came out like in the first of the three years, so to speak. And so it is the main work I interact with. And he was one of my three examiners. And so he um, did have some differences, but was kind enough to still say uh, it's of you know passable material. And that, yeah, and he did kindly endorse it as well as such. But, um, yeah, sorry, this question here to say then is, yeah, so Dale and reinterprets eyewitness had a literal vision of Christ. Yeah, I feel that, yeah, Dale Ellison's scholarship is great and, like, he worked through so many different views, in, including, like, fluently in German and French, which I severely struggle with. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and he, Dale Ellison would often say, like, there's good evidence for these things sort of happening. Yep. But what to end up making of it, I don't feel he want, he doesn't take a strong position about that. Like it's uh, historical. It's something exactly what it can be hard to say in categories. And like in his recent book, he doesn't say it's a rainbow body, but he, like he brings in this buddhist phenomenon and says you know what do we make of this like is this part of the discussion to figure out as well and sorry so i guess i'm just seeing this as that it's like just i'm might be missing the question here but yeah in general i'd be saying like yep uh i would want to say that my book is more what does memory have to say on that and his would be more like if you want what mainstream standard scholarship says about jesus resurrection it's like the go-to it's a good piece of um, scholarship but yeah if you were of a more conservative background you may be like oh i was hoping for a bit more conclusions and he, i feel like yeah i'm not misrepresenting him but he sort of says there's a lot that can be said but not sure exactly what it is but yeah and if i guess if you're a skeptic as well wanting to say like wouldn't he just say like it's all wrong like yeah that's not him either he thinks there's a lot that can be known and said 
even if he's not totally sure in the end fully what to make of it. Yeah, like like his book is obviously for those who don't know, it's it's a a massive update of his earlier two thousand five work, The Resurrection, right? Um I was fascinated to see his his uh is, is is much more sort of gray area nuancing of the events of the crucifixion itself like the darkness coming about so it could be like a Kansan windstorm you know the the location of the of Golgotha so he is is much more okay with the holy sepulchre you know Constantine church um, where the, the crucifixion site before Constantine, the crucifixion site, um, a Venus statue or something was placed on it. And then the temple was placed over where the, the tomb is. And then Constantine comes, dismembers all the whole thing. And, and, and now, you know, it's become a holy relic today. Like there's the, the tomb and there's a crucifixion site. Anyway, so it's interesting. Allison goes down those avenues to, to, um, showcase here it is like like as an actual physical thing this if this is the location so to speak right um but he he i i will be honest i'm a little bit more confused it seemed like his earlier 2005 work seemed a little bit more sort of like black and white straight to the point this newer work he seems sort of uh I I don't know if on the fence is the right way of describing it, but it's it seems like he'll make an argument, but put like a question mark at the end of it. <laughs> is that am yeah, I yeah. am I into understanding his recent work? Is that an accurate representation of his work, or am I missing something? Or... Yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot to it, but yeah, in ways he definitely does that. Like with rainbow bodies, he just raises that, and it's like a question mark: what to make of that. Yeah, I was just right. going to say, from um, he kindly wrote an endorsement for my book, and one of the things he said was about my book is that the I can approach bring it up. Is, is it new... in the PDF. Yeah, I think it's page two, probably. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. let's go there. He Oops. says like the uh, approach is approach. new to me, and in some ways that's um could be super nice. It's like as if I've made a new contribution to even a great scholar like him's acknowledging, um, although. It also could be like, well, there's a reason why others haven't done this before, and that's why, oh, sorry, I think the version you've got may not have every page as such, so it might be missing the endorsement. But, yeah, but I was saying Dallison says okay. that, yeah, just the approach that I take is new to him, which um, I was saying in some ways is nice because I've got a genuine new contribution, but it may be like, as I was saying, others haven't done that because they didn't find it useful or something. So you'll have to read and make up your mind there. <laughs> Uh, here's the endorsement. Oh, yeah. So, well researched, up to date application of memory studies to a critical issue. Uh, the approach is new to me. Yep. The concept, so this is about the, the, the concept of formal yet uncontrolled tradition commends itself. Mm. Yeah. And so that is basically saying so in the literature since the formal uncontrolled uh, formal or controlled stuff was introduced roughly 30 plus years ago there's been three categories and so I commented that there is a fourth so yeah so that's and for some scholars that may be the only thing they care about they were like oh wow he took a fourth one and they may say yes or no they agree or not but um yeah so that's one Mike Lycona's made an endorsement yeah, he kindly. What's your thoughts on his? Um, I guess yeah, I think he'd basically say that yeah, most people have used the criteria approach, and I don't necessarily disagree with the criteria, but want to ask what would memory mean for that? I think he said I could have some useful thoughts. He was also kindly one of my other examiners. Right, that's awesome. Uh, oh, Michael Bird. All right, well. Definitely <laughs> a fan of Michael Bird, yep. so that's that's cool, yeah. Uh, and Daryl Bach, so Daryl Bach is my favorite. I remember I was I was jealous because you mentioned this is sort of like a <laughs> you 
you you you mentioned that you 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 studied under him once and and he would always talk about uh american football or something like that right so, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that no and he was um one of the i mean i had several but yeah one of the skulls i really enjoyed at Dallas Seminary, and I guess because I did the historical Jesus unit with him, and then my PhD is essentially in that field. And actually, he's the one who I guess first recommended a book to me on memory, as such. Yeah, so I owe a lot to him, and my thoughts would be similar. I'm not saying he would agree with everything, although I imagine he generally would. But um, yeah, so I liked his work a lot, and yeah, he definitely did um talk about sport which is uh, great. I'm not as big into sport as such, so sometimes I didn't get all the uh, illustrations. <laughs> Actually, quickly, since we're talking about Bach, he and James Charlesworth from, I think, a 2013 publication engage with Enoch, but what's called the Similitudes of Enoch, which is... Uh, so, the Book yep, of... Yep. The book of the I know them not are, well, but yeah. Right, right. So the, the Book of the Watches are like 300 BCE dating. The similitudes used to be dated into the late first century. Bach and Charlesworth have pushed, pushed it back to the 30s BC. It has its has a lot of Son of, Son of Man, you know, imagery in it. And ergo, another interesting thing is that it's it's potentially it 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 it, it was potentially uh Put together in in Galilee, which is just like wait what, and then by the time you come to the Jesus movement and the Galilean ministry and his son of man sayings, so that I was um, fascinated with that. I was reading that recently. So Bach and Charlesworth's work on that. Yep. So yeah. yeah. Uh, I honestly I I'm satisfied with everything we discussed so far. I don't know what else. If there's well, I'm some, I'm curious yeah. about one thing. Yep. Remember when we were doing our Quranic studies, we came across a section where a verse had been written down following um, like the oration from a certain person, a certain Muslim, I, I can't remember what exactly one it was, but he has, like a lot of Muslims have wrote memorized the Arabic, but yep. not many of them actually understand what they're saying. And in this particular situation, he had flicked just a vowel over, switched oh, it over. So Reynolds calls it a turn of phrase. No, it's not a turn no? of phrase. It's a, it's a, it's a miss. Like as is his, as is a rating, his miss, like he's used a different syllable in the place of another syllable. Just say say like it was something like for example a vet would be a debt or something very basic like that so he's just flicked off like switched a, a syllable around and they've written it down but with with that switching of the syllable it actually changed it was like a two syllable word it changed the meaning of the word completely so it's a it's a different word inserted in this verse than in like the original like quran that he was orating off could it be possible that anything in these in the creeds in, in this creed particularly had they had they just orated it accidentally wrong with like a switch of a single like syllable changed the meaning of any of it or is it highly unlikely that something like that could happen yeah i got you yeah um so i do consider textual criticism but not in depth basically because i would say this there's actually been a full study done on textual criticism of first corinthians so point to that and then in first corinthians 15 i say the only one that could affect that is whether um there was an appearance to the 12 and there is a textual variant about that although the variant is to the 11 and so in a sense, either way you take it, there'd still be an appearance. And that's probably just going off the fact that uh, Judas, according to other traditions, has died. And yes, Matthias is added later. But yeah, and so basically in short, I'd say that, that yeah, there is no textual variant of that. Although your question was slightly different. And I do know like in Romans 5.1, there is let us have peace with God or we have peace with God. And I can't remember the exact word, but I do know that the difference in those two variants is over an Omicron or Omega, are basically two O's, but like a short or a long sound of that. And so like it can come into play uh, in 
New Testament exegesis and stuff like that. But yeah, and I would say I did consider that in general in the creed and there was no sort of like variants that would likely have given rise to that and that the stuff we do do still wouldn't affect the case for Jesus' resurrection and memory of that. Yeah, that's great because that really sounds like it, it nips that whole textual criticism in the bud if someone were to approach the creed and say, oh, what they really meant was X, Y, Z and just like put their own anti-theistic interpretation in there because of uh, some sort of convenient vowel change or something well, like the, that. The point is, does either reading contradict, you know, orthodox theology really? Mm. And if, it, if, if, he, if, you could, it's, if it's like a yes, <laughs> as in which one is it? And the answer is yes. Then that doesn't matter. Then, yeah, so yeah. if the meaning itself, like if the theological meaning isn't changed by any textual variance, then that's that's a win yeah. for Christianity. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't in First Corinthians 15, but it's, it may in Romans 5.1, but um, that's, I guess, not relevant. But whether we have peace with God or we, like, let us try to have peace with God, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still, the theological meaning remains much the same, peace with God. <laughs> As the underlying mm. concept, so yeah. nah, that's that's good. Um, is there any more co questions in the comment section? I haven't seen any. Um, Nothing's come up. But David, if you're happy, we can leave it there. Otherwise, mm. uh, thank you for your work. It's good. I'm happy yep, to see thanks. it all come to fruition. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for having me on, and yeah, hopefully people find it of interest. Um, it may not be uh, brilliant, but you can have some thought, discussion, and things to consider. So, yeah, I think it's Dale Allison who stated that his book was abandoned. It was not finished, but you sort of reached that point. And I can definitely understand that kind of feeling that there's always more revisions and things to say in that. Um, so you also had to do what you could to a certain point. And maybe there's a later edition or something, but yeah. You know what I'm going to do after this? Track down that Ulfa giant, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. So. All right. Well, blessings to everyone. Thanks, David, for coming on. And we'll leave it there. Yeah. Blessings. Yep. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. See you all.